Now can you hear me? It's on. Um, it's great to see you. If you're a visitor, we hope you'll feel very welcome here and that you'll return and worship with us often. I would like for everyone to please find the um, attendance pad and fill it out completely that we might have a record of your attendance today. This week, uh, being spring break, there is no Wednesday nighter. So please note that, but also do note the other activities that will be going on. In terms of prayer concerns, we want to remember the family of Nancy Fritz. Nancy passed away Thursday night. Her celebration of life will be next Sunday at uh, 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, please keep Eric and the family in your prayers. Rick Curry, our lay lector today, has an announcement to make. This is a reminder that next Sunday will be a fifth Sunday when we will take a special offering for Holston Home. Bethany came to Holston Home with a childhood of neglect and abuse as a result of parental drug use and incarcerations. She was a hurting young lady who just dreamed of being like other kids. Bethany heard the gospel message of God's amazing love and grace through the gift of her, his son. Like so many of us, she tried to just turn over a new leaf to get close to him. And then one evening, during a devotional message and time of worship, she asked Jesus to turn the leaf over uh, for her. His grace, and through his grace and finished work. She told her mentor later that night she didn't think she could ever be loved that much. When her mother, own mother loved her loved drugs more than her now she knows differently she is now a beautiful fun loving high schooler who is doing well academically and still growing in her faith host and home would not be able to serve all the bethany's that come its way without friends like you your gifts and prayers create opportunities to reach youth wherever they are and provide spiritual educational vocational and recreational experiences they have dreamed of or that they haven't allowed themselves to dream of for fear of disappointment. Host and Home is so grateful to you for your support and partnership in its life-changing work. Now, if you will uh, join me in the call to worship, it comes from Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 3, found in your bulletin. For, it, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up. Also, if you'll join me in the prayer of preparation, eternal God, who can banish the afflictions of body, mind, and spirit, touch us this day with healing grace that by your mercy our brokenness is made whole once more. Restore us to the beauty of your holiness. Through Jesus, our great physician, we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Our Psalter reading today comes from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be worshipped. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. In the Lord's word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and the Lord is plenteous redemption. And the Lord will redeem Israel from all iniquities. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 9 and 10 tells us, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. As the ushers come forth, let us now honor the Lord with our wealth.
We give thanks, O God, for all the blessings you have given to us. And with these gifts, we seek to become blessings unto others through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Our scripture today is from Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ, he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The word of God for the people of God. God. And if you would, please reach out and take hold of the hand next closest to you as we join in prayer. Gracious God, take away all those things that distract and get in our way of fully seeing ourselves or hearing your truth and experiencing redeeming love. Speak, O oh Lord, we, your servants, are listening. Amen. I want to give a shout out to Thomas Jolly for figuring out what was going on with my microphone. <laughs> so Jesus is now at Golgotha. The soldiers have pushed him down upon those beams that make up the cross. They have a mallet in one hand and nails in the other. And they're about ready to pin Jesus' hand to that cross. I want you to try to envision that rather grisly scene in the theater of your minds. And as you do, look closely at those outstretched hands of Jesus. They are the rugged hands of a carpenter. But look closer. Because they are far more than just the hands of a common laborer. When you gaze upon the hands of Jesus, you are literally gazing upon the hands of God. The very hands that were there at the beginning and brought all things into being. The, 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 the very hands that brought the plagues upon Egypt and, and split wide the waters of the, of the Red Sea. The hands that toppled the walls of Jericho. The hands that over the last three years had changed water to wine and, and brought calmness in the midst of storms. The hands that had touched leprous skin and made it clean, that had touched sightless eyes and given them new sight and, and, and touched deafened ears and opened them and gave voice to once silent lips. The very hands that gave strength to crippled legs, that embraced the outcast that lifted the dead to a new life. Make no mistake about it. The power in those hands there at the cross could have stopped it all. Jesus could have resisted every soldier there. He could have put an end to that 
to that scene, but he did not. And in our text today, Paul tells us exactly why he did not resist and why nails were driven into God's own hands. You see, what people didn't notice that day was that Jesus' hand wasn't the only thing being affixed to that piece of wood. There was something else there. Listen to again to what Paul says. He has utterly wiped out the written evidence of broken commandments, which always hung over our heads. He's completely annulled it by nailing it to the cross. See, what was being nailed to the cross that day wasn't just the hand of Jesus. It was a list. A, a list of every, uh, of every foul word we've ever spoken, every unkind deed we've ever committed. A list of all my failures, all my mistakes, all of my sins. And Jesus knew that the wages of our sin is death. And so Jesus took our place receiving the nails. So that you and I might always have a place in his presence. There that day. As the nails were driven, God declared, I forgive you. And the forgiveness in those nails is what I want us to think about for just a few moments. And let's begin with that, with this. In the nails, we see that our failures never have to be final. Again, the words of verse 13, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive in Christ, for he forgave all your sins. My friends, God was, God is, God will always be the God of the second chance. I want you to think of seven biblical names. There could be a much longer list, but, but these seven. Think of Jacob, think of Moses, think of David, think of Jonah. Think of Peter, Mary Magdalene, and Saul of Tarsus. As I said, there could have been many more, but those seven all have two things in common. And that is, there was a time in their lives when their lives were an absolute mess. Go back, read their stories, you will see it. But what they also have in common is this. Be it at a burning bush, or in the belly of a great fish, or on the banks of the Jabbok River, or on the shores of Galilee, or along the road to Damascus, every single one of them had a life-changing moment of divine encounter. Every one of them at one point or another stood face to face with the living God. And there in God's presence, every single one of them saw how far they had fallen. Their, their sins, their, their hurts, their brokenness. And every one of them discovered that God is the God who gives a second chance. That God is one who says, it doesn't matter how, how, much, how many times you've fallen, I'm going to give you another opportunity to start over. The God who says, your failure doesn't have to be the final chapter of your life. There's more to be written. There's more for you to be and more for you to do. In those nails, we see how far God would go. To save a wretch like you and me. Those nails drove home this truth. God never says, I'm tired of you. Your failure doesn't have to be final. 
What we also see here is that in those nails, Jesus restores our relationship with God. When sin entered creation, it, it, it severed the intimate relationship that God intended for us to, to experience. You remember at the end of the garden story, Adam and Eve are, are driven out of Eden. And, and there's an angel put there at the gate with a flame and sword to ensure that they never, ever return. And that theme of separation because of our sin, it runs throughout the Old Testament story. In the pride of Babel, humankind is confused and then they're scattered all over the earth. In the story of Saul, there is that awful moment when, when, when it, we read the Spirit of God departed from him because he continually continually disobeyed. In the book of Ezekiel, there is a time when the Spirit of God actually leaves the Holy of Holies inside the temple because of the unfaithfulness of Judah. And you probably remember and after David had fallen, his cry in Psalm 51 is, Do not cast me from thy presence. Do not take thy Holy Spirit from me. Sin always separates us from a holy God. It always builds a wall between ourselves and God and often between other people. And the sad thing is, there's absolutely nothing you and I can do to bridge the divide. There's nothing you and I can do to, to scale that wall or to restore that relationship which we lost. But isn't that why Jesus came? Don't you love the words of 2 Corinthians 5, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That God came to us in Jesus, and Jesus went to a cross and bore the nails to say, I will go to any extent to do what you cannot do. And that is, that is make us one with each other once more. The nails. Those nails remind us that failure doesn't have to be the end. And that Jesus has come to restore our relationship with God. To make us God's sons and daughters once more. To be that, pro that father or the prodigal that runs out and finds us and exclaims, my child who was lost is found, the one who is dead is alive, and embrace us in holy love once again. In those nails, we also discover that uh, we have a place where we all belong. Again, I want to remind you of words you heard earlier. In verses 11 and 12, we read, In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision performed by human hands, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the power of God. Now, I mention that because Paul alludes to two very specific and sacred acts. One of them is the rite of circumcision. The other is baptism. In its original use, circumcision was that, was that mark of identity. It was the mark that said, I belong to the lineage and the family of Abraham, the chosen people. For the Christian, baptism is the same thing. It is that rite of initiation which says, we belong to the people of God. Both of them remind us that, that we are made for, to be part of something that's bigger and greater than just ourselves. We're part, 
We're, we are called to be part of a holy community of faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I need that caring community. I want to know that I belong somewhere. That there's a place where I'm loved just as I am and accepted, for, or accepted just as I am and loved for who I am. That there's a place that's going to welcome me, embrace me, encourage me, inspire me, be in the struggle, uh, alongside me in the midst of struggles and celebrate with me in the midst of life's joys. I want to know that there's a place I can belong that's going to nurture me in faith, disciple me, help me to understand and recognize my gifts and, and to find a place to employ them for Jesus' sake. I'll need in my life that community that lovingly holds me accountable and in all things is there to help me grow into the, into the person that God intended when he first formed me in my mother's womb. Jesus took the nails in order to say, God still wants to claim you. And to make you part of something greater than just yourself. You belong. And I hope everyone that comes in this building always knows that truth. And then finally, in those nails, what we see is that Jesus has the power to overcome those things that would threaten to destroy our lives. Love the last verse, verse 15. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. In the, um, in the Gospels, those stories of Jesus casting out demons are a way of reflecting one fundamental truth. And that's this. Jesus came into this world to confront and destroy the powers of evil so that the powers of evil would not consume and destroy us. Jesus came to confront and destroy evil so that evil does not consume and destroy you and me. Simply put, Jesus came to make us whole. To put an end, to drive out of our lives those things that leave us broken. Those things in life that, that leave us struggling. That often see us losing the battle day after day. It might be, uh, those things might be things like a bad attitude or, or my resentments and my prejudices or my anger. It might be my lack of self-discipline or my self-centeredness. It might be a memory that I just, of a hurt or that I just can't let go of. It might be an unhealthy relationship somewhere. But anything in your life or my life that threatens to undermine what God intends, that, threat, that continually leaves us hurting and struggling and broken, Jesus came to overcome it. And make no mistake, the day that the nails were driven into Jesus' hands. Jesus took hold of every demon of every sort that has ever plagued humankind. And he overcame it. And because he overcame it that day. It doesn't matter how long you've struggled or how deep the struggle. Jesus, if we give him a chance will disarm that power, that authority, that demon, that, that point of evil and brokenness in your life even now. Remember what Isaiah said of him. By his wounds. And that's the nail prints. By his wounds we are healed. He came. 
to overcome the forces of brokenness and evil and make us whole once more. I want to close with, with words from the book on which this series is based by Max Licato. So the hands of Jesus opened up. Had the soldier hesitated, Jesus himself would have swung the mallet. He knew how. He was no stranger uh, to driving of nails. As a carpenter, he knew what it took. And as a savior, he knew what it meant. He knew that the purpose of the nails was to place your sins where they could not be or where they could be hidden by his sacrifice and covered by his blood. So Jesus himself swung the hammer. The same hand that stilled the seas now steals your guilt. The same hand that cleansed the temple now cleanses your heart. That hand that is pierced is the hand that now makes you whole. The hand is the hand of God. The nail, it's the nail of God. And as the hands of Jesus opened to receive the nails, the doors of heaven were opened for you. I hope this day we'll walk through that open door and experience again the wholeness Jesus won for us in the nails of a cross. Amen. The letter of James says, Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the, of the Lord. For such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Let us pray. O oh God, the giver of health and salvation, we give, thanks, we give you thanks for the gift of oil. As your apostles anointed many who were sick and healed them, so pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on this gift, that those who in faith and repentance receive this anointing may be made whole. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For more than 20 years, God has led me and, uh, to, to, to continue to offer as part of my ministry uh, prayers and anointing for healing. Many of you were here in, in September when we uh, uh, shared in this service before. And I'll remind you that today, um, what we're asking you to do, as you feel led and the ushers will also help direct, just come and kneel at the altar. There'll be four of us That'll be uh, praying and, and applying the oil. What you're going to be doing is acknowledging what's already happening. God's grace is already at work. Seeking to make you whole in body, mind, and spirit. The members of the choir who desire to be anointed will come first. The ushers then will... Uh, will uh, guide you if you have mobility problems... Let the ushers know, and after everyone else has been anointed, we will come and anoint you as well. So I'm going to ask those of you who are assisting if you will join me here.
David. I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Deep in your spirit, through all your relationships. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May the grace of God be there for your body, mind, deep in your spirit, through all your relationships. May the grace of God be your healing in your body. Deep in your spirit.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray for all who are hurting this day, that they may be comforted and made whole. When we are afraid, give us courage. When we are weak, grant us strength. When we are anxious, give us your peace. When we feel lost, restore our hope. In all times and in all places, help us to know the joy of your abiding love. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, our closing hymn this morning is number 295 in the cross of Christ I glory. Let's stand and sing verse 1 together. And now may the grace of God, the amazing love he revealed in the nails, and the healing, redeeming presence of the Holy Spirit, lead all of us into the life that truly is abundant and eternal. Amen.